Uh, we talked uh, a bit before about the base erosion tax that was brought in by the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And we said that the primary concern that Congress was worried about was where you have a foreign parent that has a U.S. subsidiary and is making payments, uh, normally interest and royalties are the two big ones, but there could also be, of course, service fees uh, or other types of payments that go out. And the concern, of course, was that you get a deduction at the U.S. company level, very often because of a tax treaty or just because of the nature of the payment, there's no U.S. withholding tax, the 30% withholding tax that you know and love from uh, T515, the uh, first international tax course. This concern about the erosion of the U.S. tax base brought in this, and it's focused on these types of payments these types of outbound payments. The question, of course, is how did, they, how did they define somebody who has to worry about this? They defined a new term, applicable taxpayer, and they looked at total gross receipts. Now, that's sales or service revenues. That's not a net income number. 500 million and where you have multiple corporations, usually you're going to combine the income of multiple corporations. And then secondly, they said, if you have less than 3% of your outbound payments of interest, dividends, services, and so on, to related parties, if that's less than 3%, you don't have to worry about it. That's a cutoff point, a bright line percentage. But if you do have 3% or more of these types of deductible payments to foreign related persons, then you have to worry about this. Now notice that although the target, the principal target was foreign companies that have subsidiaries in the US, there's no restriction on this to specifically U.S. companies that are owned by foreign companies. So this is a concern to any U.S.-based multinational if they have enough of these outbound payments to reach that 3% threshold. In prior discussions that we've had in, in class and in your work on the uh, you know, on the, uh, uh, the project assignment that you had. Uh, in general, I think we didn't take, or we, of course, looked at the beat a little bit, but we didn't take it too seriously because most of the planning that your major multinationals uh, have used do not involve out, outbound payments. Rather, there's inbound payments because of support that's coming from the US members of the group to the overseas companies that are making the transactions and earning all the profits. We didn't focus on that very much. Uh, however, if a US multinational is caught by this 3%, what I'd like to do is go through just a little bit of what the potential effect is, because the effect can be a lot more than I think Congress really thought about when they, did, when they put this together in the first place. And it's, it's made a lot of US companies uh, rather vocal against this uh, this uh, beat uh, mechanism. Okay, so what is, uh, what is that basic mechanism? Now again, we're starting out, we're assuming, let's assume uh, for purposes of our discussion, and I'm 
specifically focusing on this, let's say, idea of a U.S. headquartered group because, you know, hopefully uh, a good number of you will get jobs uh, with either law firms or accounting firms or some of the major multinationals that that uh, need people because they have hundreds and hundreds of people in their internal tax functions. My thought is that because of that, I'd like to at least focus this discussion thinking a U.S. headquartered group as opposed to the what Congress was focusing on mostly, which was a foreign-based group. Now, the mechanism, as I say, uh, is really a minimum tax that is much in the same vein as the alt-min tax is. Now, maybe some of you have looked at the alt-min tax for individuals uh, in another course, or if you remember, there used to be an alt-min tax for corporations uh, before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, eliminated it. This is really in the same vein. Calculate an amount which is partly based on ignoring certain tax preferences. And in this case, the tax preferences are really these various deductible payments to foreign related parties. The starting point is that 10% of modified taxable income. Modified taxable income is your regular taxable income but then add back these various deductible payments to related parties. And these deductible payments to related parties, that's what is more than, or, uh, that's what is 3% or more uh, in that earlier slide that we uh, talked about. Pretty simple, if the minimum tax, this 10% of modified taxable income is greater than the regular tax as it's defined, then that positive difference becomes the amount of beat payable. The overall formula is uh, pretty simple. 10% of modified taxable income, which again is after adding back the payments to foreign related parties. Uh, compare that to the Regular tax, if there's a positive difference, that's what gets paid. What is the regular tax for this purpose? You know, as I think uh, we often say the, uh, you know, the devil is in the details. The question, of course, is what is that regular tax? Now, what you find is a, is let's say relatively convoluted language in section 59A, but what it essentially says is that regular tax is the tax after all tax credits except R&D and certain business credits. And notice after 2025, it's the tax after all tax credits. Uh, tax credits lower the amount of regular tax. Okay, that 10% of modified taxable income, as we'll see in, uh, uh, on the next slide or two, that 10% of modified taxable income does not change itself as a result of any tax credits. But the regular tax, after all tax credits, does change to the extent of certain tax credits. Now, many of you have probably really studied the foreign tax credit, right? Yes. Yes. Do you see it up there? Do you see any mention of it on that slide? Okay, so we'll try to demonstrate this again on a, a, a later slide, but since we're not seeing anything about the foreign tax credit, what does that mean? If our 10% of modified taxable income is a certain amount, and we're subtract, subtracting off the regular tax, but after the foreign tax credit, because I said 
after all tax credits except R&D and business, certain business credits. If you're subtracting off uh, from the regular tax liability all credits that are at least certain credits that include the foreign tax credit, what does that mean about the difference? Yeah, that difference is bigger. And we'll attempt to demonstrate this. And the point is, well, gee, if it's bigger, that means I'm no longer getting any benefit from the foreign tax credit. It doesn't matter. I just kiss it off. I, I don't get any benefit from it. Uh, this, I think, is the part that uh, U.S. companies, in a sense, are so concerned about. If they get hit by the, by the beat, they'll just get clobbered in certain respects because they're not getting benefit for what many for what for many of them is a very major item the foreign tax credit and some other credits and then after 2025 all credits they would get no benefit for so when you're computing the modified taxable income you haven't already given yourself the foreign tax credit there right. the modified taxable income yeah, taxable income is before even the calculation of a tax, so yeah, okay. uh, there's no place to apply it. a credit. Okay, so uh, I'm putting up uh, some numbers in order to uh, in order to uh, then do some a calculation on the next slide, and. The idea, again, is to demonstrate what is the effect of tax credits on the beat. So we'll, our assumptions are that 10% of modified taxable income is 100, that our uh, actual tax before any credits at all, uh, in other words, as we prepare our tax return, uh, is 100. But we, of course, on our normal tax return, we reduce our actual tax by credits, and we're assuming there's R&D credits of 20, and foreign tax credits of 30, so that when we subtract those off the 100 of actual tax before credits, we get a regular tax paid after credits of 50. Okay, so your first line, the 10% of modified TI, is just a reiteration of the math below, right? I'm sorry, the... No. No, no, they're two different things. I'm, I'm specifically making the 10% of modified taxable income of 100 equal to actual tax before credits of 100 simply to isolate what is the effect of the, of the tax credits. 10% of modified taxable income, that's one number. Actual tax before credits that's on Form 1120, which is the corporate tax return, for example, that's a totally different number. They're not meant to be the same number. I'm putting them up as the same in order to isolate what is the effect of tax credits. So now we have a regular tax after credits of 50, so now we need to know what our minimum tax is. Right, exactly, and that's the next slide. Okay, so there's our modified uh, taxable income, 10% of it is 100. Our regular tax before credits, 100. Now, I've put this in the format uh, which you find in the somewhat convoluted language of uh, Section 59, Cap A. Total credits were 50, but the R&D credits we exclude from this computation, and we end up, of course, reducing the regular tax by what, are, what is effectively the foreign tax credits, the, uh, the 30. We end up with this adjusted amount of 70 as being our adjusted tax liability. And that means that we end up with a beat payable of the excess of 100 over 70 uh, gives us 30.
Yes. Okay, so we have the total credits of 50 and then less, so we're subtracting 20, and that's how we got the 30? That's how we got the 30, but because I set this up yeah, with... minus 30 is 70. Uh, yes. Okay, and then the B payable, how did we get the 30? 100 minus 70. Uh, let me uh, let me draw some vertical lines uh, in here. For those of you who have visions, hopefully, of maybe working for an accounting firm and you want to know what columns are on a worksheet, the idea is that there's three columns of numbers. 50 minus 20 is 30. 100 minus 30 is 70. 100 minus 70 is 30. And again, my, my objective here was to isolate the effect of the tax credits. That's why I chose to make the 10% of modified income of 100 the same as the regular tax before credits, making that 100. And the point is, of course, that you're getting benefit for R&D credits between now and 2025, but you're not getting the benefit of the foreign tax credits, which we said were 30, and uh, the result being that uh, our beat payable is 30, and that's an add-on to the actual tax liability, which is on the Form 1120, uh, which on our prior slide we said was 50. If our minimum tax is the regular tax after all credits except R&D, so it's 70, if that minimum tax is greater than the regular tax, which we calculated in the previous slide as 50, then we're going to pay 20 a feet. Now, let's start over again. We're, we know that we pay 50 on the prior slide, which is the, the uh, amount of tax due at the bottom of Form 1120, the corporate tax return. Now we're trying to figure out, okay, what additional amount of beat minimum tax do we pay? We know what we pay is going to be 100 minus something. That additional, that additional amount that we're going to pay under this minimum tax mechanism is going to be 100 minus something. And that something, that minus, is 70 which is the actual regular tax we would pay before credits minus effectively just the, uh, you know, just getting the benefit of the R&D credits, but not getting the benefit of the foreign tax credit. Foreign tax credit we said was 30. So if we're not getting the benefit of that 30, well, that 70 now makes sense. And our beat payable is 30. So our total tax obligation is the 50 that was on the prior slide, which is at the bottom of the corporate tax return, plus an additional 30. So the total tax for the year ends up being 80. Is that making sense now, patients? An interesting question. Are uh, U.S.-based multinationals going to have maybe more deemed paid foreign taxes as we look forward in the future? There's subpart F, and there's guilty. Right, the 80% the of the foreign taxes that are attributable to guilty, that's going to be a foreign tax credit. Now, they're, of course, still subject to the foreign tax credit limitation formula, but the implication is if you take any of the companies that you have been working on where they are earning billions of dollars outside of the United States, now, maybe they've been pretty effective at trying to hold down the amount of foreign taxes they pay, but still, they are paying some reasonable amount of foreign 
taxes in some of the countries that they operate in. Now, that's going to be part of the deemed paid tax calculation under section 960D, D is in David, the, with the 20% haircut which uh, Jen is referring to. That's going to be something that they lose the benefit of. They lose the benefit. So that's going to make, in a sense, the effective tax on guilty perhaps even higher. Any questions on, the, yeah, go ahead, Logan. The minimum um, value for regular tax is zero, right? Like it doesn't, if, it, if they're actually owed money by the government, it doesn't somehow even more. Does that make any sense? Oh, oh, if I remember correctly, uh, I believe that, uh, uh, I think what you're getting at is if there's a loss, if uh, instead, if the regular tax before credits is zero because it's a loss in the first place, I'd have to double check by looking back, but I believe that uh, you'd still end up with the, uh, uh, with the beat tax. Now, if you started out from below zero, though, uh, when you add back the preferences, then there's the, uh, the related party payments, I'd have to check back. Do you start at zero or do you start from the loss amount? Uh, probably, I'm guessing you start at the loss amount, but I'd have to look back. Yeah. And then on related party payments, it's just total outbound. It's not net outbound and inbound. Uh, right, not net. It's just uh, focusing on outbound. Uh, I don't believe there's any netting for this. This is something that will you know, have increasing, uh, I think, importance as, uh, as we go forward. And I suppose one other thing, there's, uh, as uh, some of you are aware, especially where you're in, I'm sure, the uh, T550 Global Perspectives class, there's a move on now to consider new approaches, and a lot of discussion will be to follow the U.S. lead with respect to some sort of system that gets at what the U.S. is doing with respect to guilty and with respect to the beat. How would that work in territorial systems? So that the U.S. is implementing this because it has a worldwide basic nature, but how would it work? Well, actually, uh, this is an issue which is already there for territorial system countries. Okay, and why do I say that? First of all, uh, to make sure that you have a, a little bit of background uh, on this. Okay, when we say territorial system, uh, the concept is that, for example, the UK or Japan or France or Germany, uh, uh, any of these countries would say, okay, generally the active income of a foreign subsidiary or in some cases the active income of a foreign branch of a resident taxpayer will not be taxed because we will only tax what is in what is earned within our own territory whenever you have this kind of taxation system there's a big incentive to somehow shift profits out of the home country physical territory and into either a foreign branch, if foreign branches are covered by the territorial rule, or into foreign subsidiaries. Uh, and if we look around, we find that a lot of other countries have rules that are very much the same as our subpart F. Now they're structured differently, but in terms of the basic concepts, there's a lot of similarity. Territorial systems are even more subject to the incentive to push profit somewhere else than, uh, our, uh, than was our old worldwide system with deferral. Could you quickly recap what you were just saying about with guilty and everything else, the overall negative effect? Oh, sure. Okay, the point uh, is before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, many uh, multinationals, as you're aware from the work 
uh, you did on your chosen company, many multinationals headquartered in the U.S. were able to successfully put a bunch of profits into foreign companies, into CFCs, and to achieve the benefit of deferral, which of course meant that they did not bring dividends back to the United States. Now, they normally would work very hard to sidestep subpart F so that they did not have any current recognition in the United States of any of that foreign income. They worked hard to avoid that. So as a result, the combination of all this income outside the United States with admittedly some amount of foreign tax on it and the choice not to bring those earnings back into the United States because if they did, if they paid an actual dividend, they would be hit with a 35% tax, less any foreign tax credits. They chose to leave it overseas and not bring it back. In the future, post Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we're going to see, well, maybe some of them will be hit by subpart F, but the biggest thing we're going to see is that a lot of them will be hit with guilty. They will have income inclusions because of guilty. And to the extent they have paid foreign taxes, the CFCs have paid foreign taxes, that will cause a deemed paid credit under section 960 D as in David, and that means that there will be that much, like at least I'm speculating, there should be that much more use of the foreign tax credit for these foreign taxes on guilty. So I'm expecting this to have increased importance as we go forward. Therefore, if a company, if a US-based company does have enough payments to you know, to uh, foreign related parties that it is, that it meets this 3% threshold, then it could well lose the benefit of these foreign tax credits. Uh, yes, Logan. Would it get to a point, because they can still take a deduction to the credit, right? So would it get to a point where it would make more sense to do that instead? Uh, potentially, uh, uh, potentially it could. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there's always there's always a play in a sense of looking at the overall situation. And yes, is a deduction or a credit uh, better? And uh, I can imagine that that would be uh, that could be the case in uh, some situations.